The White House says Ukraine has begun using American cluster bombs against the Russian invaders, and they're already having an impact. The Indian Prime Minister finally speaks out about two women being paraded naked and allegedly raped in the northeastern state of Manipur. And the big cat thought to be on the loose in Berlin. Right after the first video, we assumed that this was real. But at this point in time, I can unfortunately only tell you that we still haven't found the lion. Also in the podcast, a man in Switzerland becomes only the sixth person believed to have been cured of HIV. And the person overseeing NASA's mission to take astronauts to the moon and even Mars. Cluster bombs are outlawed by more than 120 countries. Although they do have a military use on the battlefield, they can pose a risk to civilians who may pick up unexploded bomblets even years later. The Ukrainians, though, insist they need cluster munitions to compensate for their relative lack of firepower in their battle to retake territory from the Russian invaders. And so the US supplied them. And on Thursday, the White House confirmed that the Ukrainian military had begun using these weapons against Russian forces in southeastern Ukraine. I heard more from Nomia Iqbal in Washington. It's been less than two weeks since the US announced that it was going to send these cluster munitions. And now they have said that Ukrainian troops have started firing them as part of this counteroffensive against Russia. Now, the US is still waiting for updates from the forces about just how effective the munitions have been on the battlefield. Of course, we know the whole thing is really controversial, it's certainly for the US's allies that don't use cluster munitions. But one of the White House spokespeople, John Kirby, did say that they're being used appropriately, they're using them effectively. And to quote Mr Kirby, he said they're actually having an impact on Russia's defensive formations and Russia's defensive manoeuvring. Is it surprising that they gave us an update at all? Have, have you had similar briefings about the use of HIMARS and, and other equipment the, the US has supplied? It's a really good question because they do give updates on the use of other weapons. But I think with cluster munitions, due to the fact that they were seen as controversial, there is this incentive, I guess, by the Americans to justify it and to explain how they're being used. Because when they announced on July the 7th that they were going to supply Kyiv with cluster munitions, there was a lot of criticism, certainly by those countries that signed the Oslo Convention, which has prohibited the use of them Since 2008, that includes uh, the British Prime Minister. He distanced himself from Washington's decision. Spain as well, criticising it, and France. And of course, it's important for Ukraine to show that it is being effective with these uh, weapons supplied by America and others in order that they keep getting new supplies as they try to push on with this counteroffensive amid reports that uh, the Russians themselves are massing huge numbers of troops in the northeast for a possible offensive of their own. That's correct. And you do have Western countries that are trying to ramp up production because they don't want to avoid Ukraine having shortages because that will also, of course, hinder Ukraine's progress. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, did also say earlier this week that Russia has this stockpile of cluster munitions and will consider using them against Ukraine if they are used against us. But it has been reported that Russia has already been using munitions uh, certainly several times in Ukraine, including in densely populated areas. Namia Iqbal in Washington. There has been uproar in the Indian parliament with the opposition demanding a debate on an alleged gang rape in Manipur. Inter-ethnic unrest in the northeastern state has left dozens dead and displaced thousands. Anger intensified after a video surfaced on social media apparently showing two women from the minority Christian Kuki community being paraded naked by a mob. The footage was reportedly filmed in May, but it was only on Thursday that the Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, addressed the situation in Manipur. It's the Deshman. In this country, in any corner of this country, law and order and respect for women is important. And I want to assure you that no culprit will be spared. Whatever has happened to the daughters of Manipur will never be forgiven. The BBC's Raghavendra Rao has just returned from Manipur, where he's been covering the violent conflict for months. 
people are horrified to see the contents of this video. In fact, there's almost an uproar. In Manipur, we have the Metei community. They are the dominant community and the tribal community called Kuki. The Manipur High Court in April came out uh, with a suggestion to the state government that they should consider granting tribal status to the Metei community. The tribal Kuki community, they went up in arms against this and we've seen complete mayhem play out in Manipur in the past two and a half months. Tribal status is part of the affirmative action of the government. It guarantees you quotas in educational institutions, in government jobs. Also, in Manipur's case, it would enable them to purchase land in hill areas, which is at the moment, not possible. Only tribal people are allowed to purchase land uh, in, in the hill areas, in the tribal areas. That is one of the major apprehension of the Kuki community. And during my trips to Manipur, we were hearing allegations being made from both sides. We wanted to ask them, was a police case registered? They would just retreat, not answer any of those questions. The police have come out saying that a case was registered as early as May itself. But it's telling that till this video surfaced, yesterday, not much progress had been made on the investigation. The chief minister of Manipur tweeted that the local police have arrested one person in this particular case. But people are finding it very hard to believe how could this action come only after the video came out? What were the police doing for the past two and a half months? The BBC's Raghavendra Rao. The Indian novelist and political activist Arundhati Roy has been giving her reaction to Rajini Vaidyanathan. You know, it's something that one has seen before and you know that they are going to just absorb this in the national news. We've seen what happened with Bilkis Bano. We've seen what happened in Hatras. We've seen what happened in Katua. You just watch it and you feel that you're going to digest it and then you have to act as though nothing happened. The thing is that Manipur has been under an internet shutdown for the last 77 days. There are more stories like this that we haven't heard about. And the only time something is said or done is when a video like this escapes the internet shutdown. But there are many more of these. And we have heard from Prime Minister Modi. He said that the incident shamed India and that the guilty won't be spared. And one of the big questions when these alleged gang rapes make national news in India is, as you say, the conversation happens. And then what what exactly changes? Look, if you remember the last time when the Prime Minister said about how much he believes in women's rights, it was on the 15th of August last year, Independence Day. And on that same day, the Home Ministry signed the special release of the men who had gang raped Bilkis Bano while she was pregnant. They had murdered her three-year-old daughter and 14 members of her family. And they were released. Some of them are allowed to campaign in BJP election campaigns. You know, the Prime Minister spoke today only because the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice, lashed out at the government. And this video became viral. The Manipur conflict has been on for 77 days while the Prime Minister has been in the US, in France, all over the world, absolutely, resolutely saying nothing. And even today, he didn't speak in parliament, although parliament was in session. He just spoke outside. What he says is shameful because what he does has nothing to do with what he says. The perpetrator should be ashamed. They took these women from police custody. The police allowed it. Since 2012 and the Delhi gang rape, more women are now coming forward. So our attitude shifting. Women are coming forward, but nothing will happen. One or two of those men will be arrested. But it's much more than just two men. It's a whole political machinery that allowed this to happen. How are the politicians responsible in this case? The politicians are responsible because the police are under them. The police are partisan. The politicians are partisan. A whole village can't go and get two women out of police custody and do this and have nothing happen to them for 77 days. We have the laws, but the law should be applied equally to everyone. But we live in a country where the law is applied depending on your caste, your class, your race, your ethnicity, your gender. Arundhati Roy talking to Regini Vaidyanathan. Since the beginning of the HIV AIDS epidemic in the early 1980s, more than 85 million people around the world have been infected with the virus. A total of five are known to have been cured as a result of bone marrow transplants that they had to treat cancer. 
Now, a sixth person has been found to be HIV-free, 20 months after stopping antiretroviral treatment. Known only as the Geneva patient, the man also had a stem cell transplant, but with a crucial difference to the other five, as I heard from our correspondent in Geneva, Imogen Folks. This patient was diagnosed HIV positive in 1990, and almost two years ago he received a stem cell transplant because he had a very aggressive form of leukaemia. Now, since then, he shows no signs of AIDS in his body. He seems to be clear. They're being cautious about calling it a cure. They're calling it long-term remission. But I think the thing that is very, very interesting, unique about this case is that there have been a few other around-the-world patients who've received stem cell bone marrow transplants and have then been clear of HIV. But the transplant itself had a particular mutation. This transplant didn't. It seems to have worked without having this mutation which is supposed to block the HIV virus. But we have to stress this particular procedure would not be a cure for millions of HIV patients around the world. And what is the significance of the fact that it doesn't have that mutation in the stem cells that this man was given? Well, this is what the doctors will be studying. They don't themselves quite know. They wonder whether the stem cell transplant works even without the mutation, or is it that he had taken antiretrovirals, this patient, for such a very long time? Maybe partly that, although he did have traces of HIV before he had the transplant. Or is it to do with the immunosuppressants that he would have to take after the transplant? They don't know. A lot more research is needed. The fact that this happened deserves much more study. So to research why this actually worked the way it did may unlock future less risky, less aggressive treatments, but along similar lines. Imogen folks in Geneva. Next to a rather unusual announcement in Germany. Die Löwen ist los in Berlin. Eine Raubkatze, mutmaßlich eine Löwin auf freier Wildbahn am Stadtrand. Well, that was a news flash on Deutsche Welle about a lioness on the loose in Berlin. Police in the south of the capital are currently searching for a big cat after two people saw an animal resembling a lion chasing a wild boar down a street. Our Berlin correspondent Damien McGuinness sent us this report. Berlin's local press is full of tips of what to do and what not to do if you bump into a lion on the street. According to police, the animal appears to be a lioness, but it's a mystery where she might have come from. No nearby zoos or circuses appear to have lost a lion. But some are sceptical that the animal is a lion at all. The only evidence are a few reported sightings and a few seconds of video of a large cat-like animal filmed in the dark. Life in the wooded area on the southern edge of Berlin, where the lion was thought to be spotted, is going on as usual. But officials are warning people to stay alert. Michael Grubert is mayor of Kleinmachnow, the area of Berlin where the search is being carried out. Right after the first video, we assumed that this was real. But at this point in time, I can unfortunately only tell you that we still haven't found the lion. And no doubt Berliners are busy reading those tips on lion etiquette. Don't run or panic, apparently, but also don't minimise the risk and slowly back away, say experts. After all, the lion may be hungry. Damien McGuinness in Berlin. Human beings are returning to the moon as early as next year, and the man taking them there is Howard Hugh. He's overseeing NASA's Orion spacecraft, which is part of the Artemis Project, a collaboration of government space agencies and private firms hoping to take astronauts to the moon by 2024 and then paving the way for human missions to Mars. There has already been a test flight. So Justin Webb asked Howard Hugh what happens next. Artemis is a campaign, a series of missions. First of all, flight tests, and then we will have a landing on the moon and a sustainable campaign to have a sustainable presence on the moon and live in, and perform science on the moon. And, of course, last year, November 16th, we launched Artemis One, the Orion spacecraft. It was uncrewed. We performed a 25-and-a-half-day mission. It was a flawless mission. All the systems worked as planned or performed even better than had planned. 
And we uh, set some records, 2.25 million kilometers total distance traveled in that 25 and a half days. And uh, we were the farthest human spaceship that has ever gone from the Earth, over 400,000 kilometers. That's another record. We broke a record from Apollo. Right. And the next stage is what? So our next mission is Artemis II, flying four crew members. Orion houses four crew for 21 days, and uh, it's a 10-day mission. It's another flight test where we'll check out the other subsystems that are needed to support human beings. So life support is very important for your survival in space, oxygen, water. And, of course, the other part is the operations of the spacecraft. Fly the spacecraft a little bit, see how it handles in space. Uh, and another very important demonstration for the future as we want to do rendezvous prox ops and docking with another spaceship. Oh, and when is that going to happen? Well, we're planning and driving towards a target of end of next year. Tell us about Orion. Stage after that, you're actually going to go to the moon and, and land there, aren't you? And this will be the first time that's happened since, what, the early 70s? December 1972 yeah. was our last Apollo mission, it's a Apollo huge 17. Moment, isn't yeah, it? A over huge 50 moment. Years. And you, when you compare the craft that you've designed with the craft that they used then, what are the differences? When we designed Apollo, everybody should remember it was a race with the Soviets at the time and uh, try to make it as light as possible and get people to the moon and back. Orion is a taxi service. It provides transportation, safe, reliable and robust capability. It's uh, different in terms of its size. Certainly, I said four crew members, Apollo was three. It weighs 87 percent more than the Apollo spacecraft with 50 percent more volume inside. It's done on purpose to try to maximize as much capability in this blunt body shape. It's a very efficient shape for returning back from lunar velocities. And so the Apollo team was very smart. We tried to scale as high, as large as we could because we need to maximize the amount of available volume and capability that spacecraft needs in order to operate in deep space for 21 days. When do you think we will be back on the moon? Well, certainly, I hope in this decade, but we will be operating very quickly uh, from Artemis II, Artemis III. Artemis III, the next mission is when we will dock directly with a human landing system and take people back to the moon and go back to the surface on the South Pole. Howard Hugh talking to Justin Webb. Still to come on the Global News Podcast. I'm here because I don't want them to keep pillaging our natural resources, using fresh water which should be for human consumption. Anger in Uruguay as the capital runs out of fresh water supplies. The bulldozing of a 300-year-old minaret of a mosque in Iraq's southern city of Basra to expand a busy road has angered locals who say it is a crucial part of their heritage. Beth Timmins has been finding out more. For the past three centuries, each day, Muslims in the city of Basra have heard the call to prayer from the Sarajai minaret overlooking the city. When its bricks were first laid, the Mamluk dynasty of Mesopotamia, the place where the world's earliest cities appeared, was still in power, soon to be overthrown by the Ottoman Empire. Its 11-metre-high dome crowned a spire of intricate turquoise patterns with uniquely interlocking arches. But by dawn on the 14th of July, all that remained of the minaret was dust and rubble. It was demolished by the city's governor, Assad al-Aidani, who said its removal was necessary to expand the road to alleviate traffic jams. And the move has drawn outrage from locals and officials, partly because Iraq's cultural heritage has been hard hit from decades of looting and destruction by the militant Islamic State group that demolished numerous ancient sites and Islamic shrines in northern Iraq. Culture Minister Ahmad al-Badrani said he had not given permission for the demolition and that local antiquities authorities had agreed with the governor to relocate and rebuild the minaret. Archaeologist Dr Jafar Jotheri from al qadisaya University in Iraq has studied the minaret and told me his reaction. This is uh, unacceptable. Of course, we are angry. We said that we immediately remembered how ICE destroyed the minaret in Mosul, how ICE destroyed Ashur. So uh, we were shocked. Basra's governor, Assad al-Aidani, did not respond immediately to my request for comment, but has defended his demolition, saying antiquities authorities were given time to relocate and rebuild the minaret. But Dr Jotheri refuted this. Everyone, believe me, everyone in Basra is angry uh, and it is shame. A disgrace. Our hope is that the central government in Baghdad, they should act actually, and then this action should not be actually forgotten. It was built in a very beautiful way. It cannot be repeated again. But you know, the problem is that the next generation of the Basra, they will not see it. 
He told me he hopes this acts as a lesson for the future protection of Iraq's treasured cultural heritage. Beth Timmins with that report. Relations between Russia and Britain have been difficult for many years, with the poisoning of Russian dissidents on UK soil leading to the expulsion of Russian diplomats. But following President Putin's invasion of Ukraine, ties between Moscow and London got even worse. Now Russia has decided to take action against British diplomats in Russia, accusing the UK of supporting what it called Ukraine's terrorist actions. Our Russia editor Steve Rosenberg told me about the Kremlin's new restrictions on British staff. With the exception of the British ambassador and three other senior diplomats, they will have to notify the Russian authorities of where they're going outside this zone, the length of the trip, the route they're going to take, the transport they're going to use, who they plan to meet, where they will stay. They can still travel, but they have to let the authorities know exactly where they're going and who they're going to meet. Now, this concerns diplomats working in the embassy in Moscow, but also the British consulate in Yekaterinburg. And the Russians say all of this is in response to what they call London's hostile actions. What do they mean by that? I think they mean principally the UK's support for Ukraine. It is another sign of the tension in relations between Britain and Russia. The UK-Russian relationship has gone from bad to worse since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. That is because principally Britain's continuing support, particularly its military assistance, for Kiev. And why now? Is this because of this speech by the head of MI6, the UK Security Service, holding out a request for Russians to come and basically spy? That's speculation. You could point to all kinds of things. You could point to the MI6 speech, which will not have gone down well with the Russian authorities. You could point to the latest attack on the Kerch Bridge, linking the Russian mainland with annexed Crimea. The day after, ultra pro-Kremlin newspapers here were full of articles claiming, without any evidence, that Britain was somehow linked to this and had provided the means for Ukraine to carry out this attack. That just gives you a flavour of how Britain is viewed by the Russian authorities here. But why would they want to target Britain compared to, say, America, given that America is providing much more support for the Ukrainians? It's an interesting question, yes. But, I mean, in terms of European countries, UK has, for a long time now, been out in front, almost like a cheerleader, in its support for Ukraine and in its provision of military assistance. And that has irked the Russians. There's a lot of anti-British rhetoric in the state media here. So it doesn't come as a surprise that the Russians have targeted UK diplomats here for these travel restrictions. Steve Rosenberg in Moscow. Uruguay in South America has been suffering its worst drought in a century. The main reservoir that supplies drinking water to the capital, Montevideo, is almost empty. There's so little fresh water left that salt water has been added to the public drinking water supplies in the city, prompting anger and health concerns among residents, as Grace Livingston reports. This is a street protest on the outskirts of Montevideo. People are banging plastic bottles and shouting, it's not drought, it's plunder. They say the government is allowing big industries like forestry and soya to use large quantities of water, while people here are running short of fresh water to drink. I'm here because I don't want them to keep pillaging our natural resources, using fresh water, which should be for human consumption, to power machines and economic projects that only benefit a few. Extremely low levels of rainfall have left reservoirs almost empty and rivers depleted. The authorities have started taking water from a river estuary where seawater mixes with fresh water giving tap water a very salty taste. Uruguay is the richest country in South America, with the highest GDP per capita. Here in Montevideo, with its tree-lined avenues and smart shopping centres like this one, people are stunned that they no longer have access to decent drinking water. The government is advising pregnant women and people with health conditions not to drink tap water in the capital and surrounding areas. But bottled water is very expensive for many families. Estela Recalde lives by a rubbish dump on the edge of Montevideo, selling the plastic waste she finds there. For two months, she's been struggling hard to buy bottled water for her children. 
For me, it's been very difficult to get water every day for them. We've been drinking tap water, but not our children. We'd rather that we get ill, not them. Two weeks ago, the government started giving money to half a million poor and vulnerable families to buy bottled water. But Estella says it's not quite enough. The government's also distributing bottled water to hospitals and schools. Daniel Penner, a researcher at the University of the Republic in Montevideo, says there's several reasons why the city is running out of drinking water. For three years there's been a drought. This is related to the La Niña weather phenomenon, but also to global warming. This is also connected to deforestation in the Amazon, because that affects the water cycle on the continent. There are two more problems. The government did not foresee this crisis and has not managed it well. And the plundering of water by multinationals and big extractive companies. But Industry Minister Omar Paganini says the water crisis is not caused by agribusiness because rice, soya and forestry plantations are based in other parts of Uruguay where there's no shortage of water. He says the government is building a desalination plant on the River Plate to prevent future water shortages. This is a big project in the short term for Montevideo while there's a pipe being built from River San Jose due to be in place in two or three weeks. Probably when El Niño comes into place, finally we'll get lots of rain. It started to rain on and off here, but not enough to fill the city's main reservoir. Uruguay's president recently warned that without rain, Montevideo will soon run out of drinking water that's fit for human consumption. But many here have already decided that tap water is unsafe to drink. Grace Livingston in Uruguay. One of the candidates in the race for the White House is the third son of Bobby Kennedy, who was himself assassinated while running for US president in 1968. Robert Kennedy Jr. has entered the race for the Democratic nomination against Joe Biden. He's very public about a voice condition he has called spasmodic dysphonia. And here he is launching his bid at a rally in Boston earlier this year. My mission over the next 18 months of this campaign and throughout my presidency will be to end the corrupt merger of state and corporate power to commoditize our children, our, to hollow out the middle class and keep us in a constant state of war. Here he is speaking to the American podcast host Joe Rogan last month about his paranoia surrounding the death of his uncle, President John F. Kennedy. You're talking about your uncle who was assassinated and you believe the intelligence agencies were a part of that. What happens to you? Well, I got to be careful. I'm aware of the of that danger and you know, I don't live in fear of it, but I'm not stupid about it and I take precautions. Daniel Lippmann covers the White House for Politico in Washington. He told Evan Davis more about Robert Kennedy and why his campaign is raising eyebrows. He was an environmental advocate. He had started this group promoting clean water and cleaning up our rivers. But more recently, in the last 10 years, he has really gotten into anti vaccine advocacy, and especially with uh, COVID-19, bringing up conspiracy theories about the virus and raising doubts about the vaccine. And so he is one of the top personalities on this subject. He has had millions of fans and lots of listeners and readers, especially on the conservative end of the spectrum. He's running as a Democrat. What is going on? Because a lot of his support seems to be coming from the more Trumpy wing of American politics. And indeed, Donald Trump's called him a good guy. Well, the Kennedy family is a Democrat family. And so basically, no matter what, they run as Democrats. And so, yeah, I think he probably viewed it as he could get more attention running in a primary with basically token opposition. There's no debates. Biden is very likely to win in every state. And so he wanted to make a stand. He wanted to kind of revive his reputation a little bit, get media attention. I'm sure he's been selling out his books and getting more speaking gigs out of this, lives a pretty lavish lifestyle. But 
he does have a real following and he is hitting double digits in some of the polls for 2020 for the Democratic primary. I mean, he's considered quite charismatic. And I've spoken to Americans who say, keep an eye on him, but he's not going to displace Biden as the candidate. There aren't. There's no chance. Even if Biden, God forbid, had a health incident where he couldn't run in his own primary, you would see the field open up to people like Gavin Newsom and Kamala Harris and Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of uh, Michigan. They're much more in tune with where the Democratic Party is. But Robert F. Kennedy Jr is not just sceptical about vaccines. I think most people regard a lot of what he says as rather unhinged, really. Yeah, most of his family does not support him. They've uh, opposed him. One reason he's been in the news in the last week or two is that there was this video of a private dinner that he was speaking at in New York in the last week without any basis in reality. He was saying the coronavirus is targeting white and black people and sparing Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese people and there's just no basis to that. COVID-19 is targeted to attack Caucasians and black people. The people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese. Completely bonkers. You know, someone, as someone who is Ashkenazi Jewish, I have had COVID and lots of my Jewish friends have had COVID. And I wish we were spared, but we not to think the Democratic Party has moved to the left and moved to be anti-establishment and anti-dynistic. And so that is bad news for the Kennedys. Daniel Lippmann of Politico. Finally, two Indonesian women have apologised after holding a lavish wedding ceremony for their Alaskan Malamute dogs. The event in Jakarta reportedly cost more than $13,000. Viv Marsh has the details. The photos of the fake nuptials of Jojo and Luna caused a social media outcry. Some showed the canine couple wearing elaborate traditional Javanese costumes as they took each other's paws in marriage. In another, the four-legged bride was seen dressed in a white gown with a net ruff. Wealth distribution in Indonesia is among the most unequal in the world and the income gap is growing. President Joko Widodo has warned rich people and public officials in particular not to flaunt their money. Embarrassingly for him, local media reported that one of the dog's owners is employed by the presidential office. Both owners insisted that they meant no harm and apologised for any insult they'd caused to Javanese or Indonesian culture. But one Twitter user angrily described the wedding as social blindness. Another wrote that common sense had gone, trampled by the desire to show off. Viv Marsh. And that is all from us for now, but there'll be a new edition of the Global News podcast very soon. This one was mixed by Daffeth Evans and produced by Emma Joseph. Our editor's Karen Martin. I'm Oliver Conway. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>